And this is Kristen. And this is a thousand miles of true crime. So Ashley, we have not caught up in a minute. I have absolutely no idea what today's case is going to be about. I'm so excited though, because I love the Easter eggs of like just not knowing and being surprised as we're recording. So can you, can you tell us what today's episode is going to be about? Of course. This is funny. I forgot you didn't even know what I was covering today. So I'm going to be covering the case of Rebecca Zahau. Are you familiar with this one? I think, but I'm not 100% sure. I feel like as you go into the details, it might kind of dawn on me, but the name doesn't stick out right away. Okay. I'm sure you've heard about this case, but it's been a while. So it happened around 2011. So, but this is one of those cases like everybody heard about, but I don't think you've probably gotten to really dig into it, at least not recently. Ooh, I'm excited. Yeah. The other exciting thing is this was actually the very first recommendation I ever got. So one of my awesome coworkers, when we started the podcast right away, he recommended that we look into this case. So, so I'm doing this for him, but it was a really cool case. And like I said, I am excited about it. It's also been what it's been like two episodes since I've talked about a really rich person. So I'm going to, I get my millionaire in there again. And let me be honest, guys. I thought I was covering rich people before. I was not. They were a joke compared to who we're about to go over. So this whole case will take place in a mansion, which I love. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So let's dig into it. Rebecca Zahau was born in Burma and, you know, her family was not that well off. They were very poor and they were all living in this small house. Her sister talks about how her and all of her siblings, there's four of them, were living in one room and they were kind of just doing whatever they could to survive. And her parents were born, were born again Christians. So they they raised their kids in the church. They had this, you know, big Christian faith. And her father was active in politics. And at this time, it's really not safe because Burma's being run by a dictator and Other people that he knows have now been killed or gone missing, and he knows it's not a safe situation. So they decide they have to get out of there. And they go to India for a while, um, and then they land in Nepal. Her sister talks about how they spent a good amount of her, you know, her childhood, a good amount of their life in Nepal. And then they ended up in Germany, and eventually they would finally end up in the U.S. This, you know, obviously gives Rebecca a unique perspective of the world, but she also speaks six languages. So clearly she's no dummy and I, you know, she's going to try to find ways to use this uh, to her advantage. That's an incredible talent to have to speak six languages. Um, That's one of the, the things that I wish or hope to one day be able to attain, but six languages, that's insane. Yeah. And she was fluent in them. We're not talking like she could ask where the bathroom was in these languages. I mean, she was truly fluent in all six of these languages. So she decides she wants to go into the medical field. Again, I think that is possibly a great opportunity for her to use all these languages, but she ends up getting a job at 28 with an ophthalmology clinic in Phoenix. And she actually loves it. She loves being an ophthalmology tech. She sits for the certification and everything. And she decides this is the path that she wants to pursue. So at this time, her family's living in Minnesota. And again, she's enjoying her life in Phoenix. And in walks this very charming client. He's a 53-year-old CEO of a pharmaceutical company. And, you know, he's a self-made millionaire. And are you familiar with Restylane, like the wrinkle filler? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so like this is what they created and they sell and stuff. So, I mean, this, this, just imagine how much money this guy has. This company is making billions. He's big time. He's big time, it sounds like. Yes. He is big time and they actually have a lot in common. Like everybody says, this isn't like he's looking for some young girl and she's just, you know, looking for a sugar daddy situation. They, they both love to work out and they eat really healthy and they're, you know, just embracing this healthy lifestyle and they think family's important and, you know, they're really 
they're really growing close. So at this point, it's about two years they've been dating. And, and Jonah, did I already say his name? I feel like you said a 53 year old, handsome millionaire. I don't think you said his name. Jeez, you guys know what I think about him. I didn't even, I'm like, let me tell you how much he makes. I didn't yeah, even... this is, this is the money take right here. Right. right. <laughs> the owner of the mansion. <laughs> Sorry about that. So his name is Jonah Shacknai. And Jonah's obviously got his own past. He's 53. He's been married two other times to yes, younger women. Um, specifically, they were both pharmaceutical saleswomen. And so he had a, he had a few kids with them. He, his first wife, he had two kids with, so they're now teenagers and Gabby and Ethan are not huge fans of Rebecca and they make it, they make it known. And so she had actually moved in, like she had tried to move in previously and it was, you know, a really big fuss. It didn't go over well. She ended up moving out. She let things calm down for about a month and then moved back in. He also has a six-year-old Max. And Rebecca is really close with Max, even if Max's mom doesn't love that. And so they get along and Jonah does not like to stay in Phoenix for the summer. He thinks it's too hot. And he had previously with his last wife purchased a mansion in Coronado. So he spends his summers there. He wants to go and, and do that this summer. And he's telling Rebecca, like, you should really come with us. Like you're getting really close with Max. You can just quit your job and help me with Max. And obviously she's very hesitant. She's like, you know, I'm just really kind of establishing myself. And I also send back money to my family. So she's sending them at least 400 a month and they're going to be lost without that money. She wants to be able to help them. And he says, don't worry about it. Like money, money's not an issue here. I'm going to take care of you. I will send your family the money. We don't have to worry about this. Just come here, enjoy your summer and spend some time with Max. And the, the other kids would be there at some points too, but it was mainly Max because he has, he has them about, 50, he has Max about 50% of the time. That's a huge ask too, to like ask someone to pretty much give up their, their independence and their means of income, you know, regardless of how much money he has and whatever promises he's making, like, oh, I'll send money to your family or whatever. I'll take care of it. It's still, a, that's a big sacrifice and a big ask to have someone give up their own like persona really, you know, to just kind of tag along with this millionaire. Did she do it? She did end up doing it, but we'll later find out that she even writes about how like, she's not even engaged. Like she kind of has this feeling of like, why did I do this? Like he hasn't even really committed himself to me, you know? So, I mean, I, I think we'll find that she possibly regretted this decision, but she, she did love him and she wanted to be close to him. And I don't even think this was like a situation where she was like, I want to enjoy my free time and really live it up over the summer. Like she was really trying to progress this relationship and grow closer to the family. Let's dig into Max Shackney a little more. He is adorable. He is a happy six-year-old boy. And like I said, his dad's Jonah and then Dina Shackney is his mom. So this is Jonah's second wife. Well, actually, and part of the drama in this is that Max's parents, when they divorced, they were in the process of getting divorced when Rebecca started dating him. So, you know, they were still just separated. And so obviously Dina doesn't like the fact that like, Rebecca sort of moved in and on her territory so quickly. So I think there's always going to be sort of hard feelings. Plus, come on, you know, it is, I'm sure I haven't been in this situation, but I'm sure it's really hard to like blend a family to see your son having you know, fun with this other lady who's taking care of him. I'm sure it's hard for Dina to take. It's definitely an awkward situation. Blended families encounter a lot of things and situations like that. So I'm sure Rebecca had some, you know, probably multiple instances of like just awkwardness of trying to fit into this family. They're all just trying to adjust. Now they've moved to this other house. And let me just dig into the house a little. You guys know I love to talk about a mansion. <laughs> <laughs> so this place is right on the ocean and it has 11 bathrooms and it has a guest house bigger than both of our houses. So 
And of course, it's obviously separated by an amazing pool, a spa, and a courtyard. Wow. <laughs> So on July 11th, 2011, Jonah decides, Hey, I'm going to go to the gym. I want to get a quick run in and leaves his son, Max there with Rebecca and her sister, Zena, who's actually 13 is she's there visiting. And they're all supposed to go to the zoo later. So, th so they're kind of getting ready. Zena's in the shower and Rebecca just runs to the bathroom really quick. And Max is playing on the second floor. And she hears this really loud bang. Like it, you can hear it throughout the mansion and she's really freaked out. She comes running out and she sees that somehow Max has fallen. This is a bad fall from the second, from the second story. And she didn't see it. So she's not a hundred percent sure what happened, but she notices that while he's laying there, his scooter is on top of his legs and the chandelier has fallen. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And Rebecca reports that all Max said was ocean and then sort of passes out. So their dog's name is actually ocean. And so she's assuming he's referring to the dog. So he loses consciousness. And then she starts screaming for her sister to call 911. And Zena, you know, gets on the phone. She's freaking out. Rebecca starts doing CPR and, and the paramedics get there. And they rush him to the hospital and they find that he's got fractured facial bones, a bad spinal cord injury, and eventually they're going to find out brain damage. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Like this is, this is, this is horrible. It's so sad. And like, what are they going to do? And everybody keeps asking her all of these questions. Like, how did he fall? How could this happen? what happened and they're, they're getting really mad at her because she's not really giving them answers but by her own account she was in the bathroom she doesn't know it's not like she saw what happened do you know like the layout of the of the house or like the second floor of where he fell from like was it like a loft you know like these modern mansions like it's all open was it like that like a fall like that from like an open space on the second floor that caught you know allowed him to fall down to the first floor that's insane yeah so I was gonna go into all this but let's just cover it right now this house I, I'll obviously post pictures but please like google it right now this landing it's first of all there's carpet so there's a lot of questions that are going to be brought up about this because if he's riding a scooter there's this thick carpet throughout the entire upstairs and the um, and the stairs themselves. So it's, it's not like a huge opening, but these are, these are big stairs. This, again, this is a mansion. This isn't like your house. This is the kind of thing. I didn't mean that to you, Kristen. I just met some, <laughs> most of the listeners. If you're listening from a mansion, awesome. We love you. Message me, please. Uh, but yeah, this is, it's a very huge opening. This is not a, this isn't a small fall. What, I'm sorry. I, I'm probably not even answering your question. What did that answer? Well, your I was just though? asking. No, you answered it. Like the, the layout I was saying, I mean, obviously it's huge. It's massive. There's probably like 70, 80 stairs to the upstairs, yeah. but like it's, it's open, right? It's open. So it's open. Yeah. So there's a big chandelier in the middle and then the stairs kind of go around, but they, they're very, uh, like it's very squared. It's not, it's not like a spiral staircase. It's, um, Again, more I'm rigid. Doing, yeah. I'm not doing a great job of describing this. I'm so sorry, you guys. But, um, again, that's what Google is for. Please take, <laughs> let's take a moment and, and Google this. So I, I mean, I've heard some theories. There's definitely nobody's 100% sure what happened, but there's these theories that Max was trying to like ride down the banister, uh, on his scooter and do some like crazy trick. Uh, I've also heard that his brother would sometimes, you know, ride down the banister. So some people think that he was doing that. I even heard this other crazy theory. I really couldn't, I, I hadn't seen this anywhere else, but this one guy claims that he thinks that, that his soccer ball. So Max's soccer ball had actually gotten caught in the chandelier. So then Max was trying to like use the scooter, like the razor scooter to knock the ball off the chandelier. And then somehow like it all just goes wrong and he ends up falling. 
like a total freak accident, right? Yeah. Like a lot of, most people assume this is a total freak accident. So Dina is very insistent that like her son is not this type of person. He's not a daredevil. He would absolutely not be trying to ride down the, you know, down the banister or anything like this. She really still to this day even stands by that. She doesn't think he was like trying to swing from the chandelier or any of these crazy theories. She says he's not that type of kid. How do I mean, how do you feel about that? You have kids. So, I mean, kids are going to get into things and I mean, sure. You can have an idea of what you think your kid won't do, but accidents also happen. Right. I mean, my kids have, have gotten hurt doing things that I would have never thought that they would do. Or like, like, you know, better, why are you doing that? Why would you do that? And that could be anywhere from like putting something in their mouths to like touching a hot stove or, you know, or even just running in the house. Um, I mean, okay, I'll give you maybe a short story. My son being told, absolutely, you are not to play video games upstairs on daddy's TV because, you know, if you get upset and you throw the remote, you could possibly break the TV. Well, guess what? He did that. And it was an accident. Like things can happen. You know what I'm saying? You know, no, no matter what kids are going to be kids. And, you know, you could say all you want. My kid would not do that. He's not a daredevil, but accidents happen. Like freak accidents actually happen. Yeah, it's true. And I think kids will try to push the limits. Like I kind of agree with that. I love in your story that you just know your son's going to get mad and throw his controller like this. this and that my friend is why the rule was implement implemented. It's like, no, you can't play upstairs because we know you like to throw your controller and guess what? He broke the TV and we were livid, but we can't, we weren't surprised because he shouldn't have been up there to begin with. So when it happened, it's like, well, we told you <laughs> this would likely happen. And it did. So, yeah. Well, and to your point too, with the rules, they had admittedly told Max several times not to ride a scooter in the house. Like this is a, a rule that he was constantly breaking. It's, I mean, to me, it's probably not that out of the realm of possibility. And they did find that the scooter had white paint on the bottom of it that really lined up with the railing. So Ooh. yeah, yeah. So again, there's still a lot of questions though, but Jonah and and Dina, his mom, are they, they're at the hospital. And, you know, Jonah asked Rebecca not to come. <laughs> what? I, I mean, I can kind of understand it. Like, Dina's already not Rebecca's biggest fan. Now her child was left alone with Rebecca. And now her son's in the ICU. So I can see, I can see your, your shock and sort of frustration. <laughs> uh, and but, but I can kind of understand both sides. If I was Dina, I would not want to see Rebecca right now. Yeah. But I mean, I would almost be like, oh, I want her to come up in here. No, I'm kidding. I mean, I, I get what you're saying too. I mean, was she questioned? Like, you know, you said they were asking her questions and stuff like that. Like what happened? I mean, if I'm the, if I'm uh, Dina, I'm going to be like, well, I want to know, like, what did you see? Like, what do you remember? Or even her sister, like Zena. Did, did you see what happened? You know, like, what was he doing upstairs? Was he on the scooter? Was he just playing by the, the ledge or something like that? Or was he, you know, I'd be wanting to ask questions. Well, it's a great segue into meeting Nina. That's Dina's twin sister. So Nina and Dina. And Nina obviously flies there right away. She wants to be with her sister. She wants to be with her nephew and she wants to be with Rebecca because she wants to ask some questions. Like she feels that the cops aren't taking this seriously. Like nobody's jumping on this and they, they have a lot of questions here. You know, Nina felt that Rebecca was acting strange and she wasn't giving her straight answers and she wasn't telling her what happened. And, and everybody, I think that again, if, if this all happened the way it did, Rebecca doesn't know what happened and that's just not going to be a good enough answer for this family. You know, they're devastated. They want answers. <laughs> and that's actually, I'm sorry, I didn't write this in my notes, but that's, that's one of the, the, I don't know, messed up parts talking about asking Rebecca not to come to the hospital. 
but they did ask her to pick up Nina when they know Dina doesn't like Rebecca. Like, what do you think her twin sister thinks about Rebecca? Wow. Yeah. So Rebecca is, again, she's just trying to do what she can. She picks up Nina. She actually even boards the dog ocean because she knows there's a lot going on right now. And and she wants to make sure that the dog's okay. So she finds somewhere to board the dog. And then the next day she'll actually take her sister to the airport because she wants to you know, send Zena back home. This isn't really the best environment for her. So she gets her on a plane to Minnesota and then she picks up Jonah's little brother, Adam. And he's a tugboat captain from Mississippi. I think at the time he's living in Tennessee. And, which is kind of funny too, because everybody, everywhere kind of presents this brother as like, you know, kind of being like the messed up brother, like Adam, he's only a tugboat captain, you know? And I looked it up in the average salary for a tugboat captain is between 63,000 and $140,000 a year. But I guess when you're like comparing, you know, Jonah, this millionaire to his brother, like, I'm like, this guy's probably not that bad. (laughs) He probably had to work up to become the tugboat captain, but he's pretty weird anyways. So that'll be the last time I'm defending him. (laughs) So Rebecca takes Adam to the ICU. They go straight to the hospital so that he can see his brother and his nephew. And then Max is stable. Nothing's really happening. So they decide to go to dinner. And so this is Jonah, Adam, and Rebecca. Dina stayed with her son. This is, so this is the day after Jonah had his accident. And they're eating, they, both the brothers kind of describe it as just being awkward. No one's really talking or they're really not even eating that much. You know, everyone's just really depressed. Even Adam describes Rebecca as like clearly being devastated. She's just sort of picking at her food and they are going to head back to the mansion and Jonah's going to head to the Ronald McDonald house because he's staying there because he's trying to stay near the hospital, you know, and they'll only allow one parent in, in the ICU overnight. So Dina's going to stay with her son. He's going to stay close by. As Adam heads back, he goes to the guest house, which everyone says is kind of weird. There's all these houses or there's all these rooms in the mansion. Why wouldn't you stay there? But Adam says, every time that I go stay with my brother, I stay in the guest house. So why, why wouldn't I stay in the guest house? So he claims that he took some sleeping pills and went to sleep around eight o'clock. He wakes up the next morning and looks at some porn and pleasures himself and then takes a shower. (laughs) Okay. And we know this from him. Like we didn't, this isn't like they found a DNA sample. Like he just like. Voluntold that information. Yeah. He volunteered it right away. They asked him, what did you do? (laughs) Like what happened? He's like, I woke up took care of myself. Um, yeah, he just gave that information right out. So then he heads to the main house to get some breakfast where he finds Rebecca hanging outside from a balcony of the guest, of the guest bedroom. So it's part of the main mansion, but it's from the guest bedroom's balcony. And this is at 648 when he calls 911 and he says, I got a girl has hung herself. An ocean, bar, an ocean Boulevard, across from the hotel, where you picked up the boy yesterday. Like that? Like fragmented as hell? Yeah, that's exactly what he said. That's word for word what he said. You know, and he's like, it, it's just, there's no, like, it, it sounds like he doesn't know who this girl is. It sounds like he has no clue where he is. Nothing. So the call's really weird. The 911 operator has like a ton of questions. She's trying to figure out where he is. He just keeps saying like, you guys picked a boy up here yesterday. When it it actually been two days at this point. So it's been 48 hours. So she's even checking the log and she's like, I I don't have anything that fits this description. Nothing on Ocean Boulevard. Like I need the address. So you can hear on the call, he's like running around. Allegedly he's cutting her down. While this is happening, he's also looking for the address because he has to run, like, I'm assuming he ran outside or somewhere he knew he had the address to get them the address. And he says that she's naked. She's gagged by a long sleeve blue t-shirt and her hands were tied behind her back. 
and her feet were also tied up. They're bound. And later they're going to realize that she's, this is all she's bound and she's hanging by a rope that's used for skiing. Have you ever been water skiing? No, no. It's like a, it's a thicker rope. So and okay. it's red. It's like a bright red. And this is all wrapped around her. And this rope's from the house. So why would he even want to like try and cut her down? Like I would be like, I'm not touching anything. <laughs> I'm just going to call 911. I th- and I think he, I think that's kind of what happened is like, he, you know, he calls and then they're like, did, did you cut her down? Is she alive? Is she okay? <laughs> Let me, I'm jumping ahead, but he is these brothers. I'm telling you there, there's something else. They, they, she, so this is what he says. He says, I don't know if she's alive or not because she's, a different skin color than me. And so I can't tell if she's blue or not. Like, so because she's Asian, you don't know if she's dead or not. I don't, I really don't understand. Are you serious, Ashley? Is that on the call? Yes, it's on the call. And this isn't even, this isn't even like the worst thing they say. Like, I'm gonna, yes, let let me, let me keep in order, but yes. So, They find what they eventually realize that the rope was tied to the bed frame. So she allegedly she does. She ties it to the bed frame, does all this, ties herself up um, and then hangs herself. He says when he sees her right away, he runs into the kitchen. He grabs the knife, tries to cut her down. And then he that's when he takes the shirt out of her mouth and does CPR. So the 911 operator does ask if she's alive. That, that's when he mentions the whole thing about the, the different colors. But another thing that everyone points out is weird is he's just like yelling and he's sort of frantic and he says, are you alive? <laughs> oh my God. No, this is not funny. So I'm not laughing like at the situation, but I am laughing at Adam because he sounds like he is not the brightest in the bunch. Yeah. I mean, and I think like, yes, like after seeing a bunch of interviews with him, I don't think he is. I think this is a frantic time. I don't think that this necessarily indicates that he did it. I think that it could be like, oh my God, I just walked in on this body hanging here. And did I even mention that she's naked? She's completely naked. Right. Yeah. You mentioned that. I'm sorry. But yeah, I think I would also be in shock. I also did have to laugh because I I think that's like something really stupid that I would do when I was frantically trying to figure things out, like just yelling at her, like, tell me if you're alive. But just hearing it on the recording, you're like, oh, Adam. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've been in a situation where like a, a body is present and the reactions you know, they're unexpected or they're like, you know, unpredictable. It's, it's like what you think you would not do that you, you actually in turn do do in a situation like that. So, I mean, it's, it's possible, but just, I don't know, like him, you know, calling out, like, are you alive? And the skin, skin tone thing, like what? like, does she have a pulse? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, come on, what does that have to do with anything, man? Luckily, the cops were able to tell her through her skin tone, but unfortunately the cops get there right away. They know she's dead. They say like, she's dead. Come on. We got to call in the corner. And when they ask him what happened, he says, oh, I assume she killed herself. Uh, You know, maybe some of this is cultural. I never thought this all through. Again, that's an exact quote. Maybe this is cultural. Maybe this is cultural. And this is what him and the whole family go, go with the whole time. Like this is. They're sticking and standing by that. Yeah, completely. Okay. (laughs) Continue on, please. I need to hear more. Yeah. There's nothing I can say good on this topic and we will hear more about it, but they call in the medical examiner, but it takes them about 12 hours to actually show up. And the cops, unfortunately, they just leave Rebecca's body laying there naked on the ground in the hot sun. Uncovered? Completely uncovered. And of course, there's all these cops showing up to a mansion. So what do you think that attracts? 
Yeah. And then too, this is ocean drive. Like this is like, I, from what I understand, ocean drive is like, I mean, I don't want to say like a popular celebrity area, but like, I feel like ocean drive is a big deal. Like, like how you said millionaires, billionaires live on ocean drive. Like these are, this is populated area where I I would think that they would have covered her body, but it, they didn't. Okay. No, they didn't. And so news helicopters start flying over and they get footage of this. Oh no, that's horrible. Yeah. You want to talk about horrible. So they do air it. They blur it out, but you can, you know what it is. You can tell what it is. And that's how Rebecca's family finds out. They got a call from Jonah saying that Rebecca killed herself. But like, that's all he gave them. He wasn't like, he didn't say any of these weird details, nothing. So they didn't find out until they actually see her lying there on the news. But the San Diego medical examiner gets there. He just, he determines that it's suicide by hanging, but she had bruises on the back of her arms and legs. She had a fractured left arm. They don't find any alcohol or drugs in her system. And they've determined that the knots used to tire were commonly used in sailing. And Adam is a what? Exactly. So yeah, they 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 claim they're very common, but like I've seen these knots. This is something I could just tie. And as far as I know, Rebecca, I couldn't find anything saying that you know, she was crazy into sailing or crazy into, you know, anything like this. Like she doesn't have a history and not, you know, she, just cause she speaks six languages doesn't mean she can tie any knot behind her back kind of thing. And even still, even if you know how to tie this knot, can you tie this knot and then bind your own hands? Right. Yeah. And, and, and feet, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like what? So we'll get into if this is actually possible or not. I could, I mean, I couldn't do it. She, she was very fit. Again, if she was really, if she did know things about knots, maybe, but I don't know. They determined that her approximate time of death is around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And in her bedroom, they find two paintbrushes and then a, a garbage bag and black paint. And then just to make things even weirder, they find writing painted on the door and it said, she saved him, can you save her? Yeah, what? I don't, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. And then more than one neighbor said they heard a woman screaming, but the cops just ignore this. They think it could be anything. They ignore that? Yeah, yeah. How they- do you ignore that? They say they, they could could have just been anything. Uh, they also find a footprint on the balcony, but they say that must have just been a cop while he was up there. It must have been a cop's footprint. They also find, they find drops of blood in a few spots around the house. And they are able to confirm that Rebecca's on her period. And they think that those spots were from that. So she didn't have any um, like open wounds on her. Okay. So they also go through the guest house and the evidence technician finds a pair of white, pink, and purple women's underwear in a wastebasket in the guest house where Adam Shackney had been staying. They never tested it. Jonah says that his daughter had had a friend over and they were staying in the guest house the week before. So they claim that's what it was from. So another thing that I think is weird, and I couldn't find a lot of information on it, was that Rebecca was, so she was found, this all happened in the guest room. So it's not like their bedroom. Um, they, they always call it the guest room. So I'm kind of confused why she was staying in the guest room. Was this like just since the incident? Uh, was she always just using the guest room? That, that wasn't super clear to me. But they, they, found, they found all the stuff in there. They confirmed that the rope was from the garage. The other weird thing that they find, you know, they find these two knives. And one of the knives had blood that they was also mixed with vaginal fluid. So they're thinking that it was again from her menstrual 
blood being on there, but they find it all the way around, like on all four sides of this handle of the knife. As if it was used like to insert into her vagina or something like that? No, not according to the cops. Oh my gosh. What? Yes. So they, they had found the paint in the paintbrushes and they'll eventually find that on the paint, they find a fingerprint of Rebecca's, but this is Rebecca's paint supplies. So to me, it's completely understandable that you would find her fingerprints on them. Right. That makes sense. Unfortunately, they also find a book of witchcraft and they find a similar image inside this book of a woman who's, you know, tied up in a very similar manner. Whose, whose book was that? Like, did they have, did they trace down who it actually was purchased by or belonged to? They believe it's Rebecca's. I don't think they did too much research on it. Uh, I'll just say like, I, I'm not even in my room, but I'm just like looking at all the books I have right around us right now. You know, I'm like I have multiple serial killer books. I got, you know what I'm saying? I'm just like, you know, I, I would hope that they wouldn't walk in here and say, well, like, look at what she was reading. Cause I do think that they kind of just looked at that and said like, oh, maybe this was some sort of sacrifice or something. They just labeled her immediately and like labeled the situation. And that's actually really terrible because, you know, people can have a common interest in something. It doesn't necessarily mean that defines who they are. Right. Exactly. Like she, this could have been like a joke gift or something. You know what I mean? It could have been a million things, but for or it could have, to- yeah, even been just an old book. I mean, I don't know in the nineties, I was probably dabbling in the silly, weird things like that. And I don't know, like, what if I still had a book or something? I, I don't necessarily get rid of my books just because I've read them already. You know what I'm saying? It's like a collection. Yeah, that's so, a good point. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to find out she was really like the world's biggest the craft fan or something. Right. She's a Wiccan. I mean, really? Right. Like, and, and, and Jonah would not have like known that, would not have had some inclination that she was into something like that. And it's also only that book. It's only that book. They don't find, there's no like pentagram under the bed or like, you know, they, they don't find this secret life. They find one book. And, and like, this is, and this is Jonah's house. So what if it's his book, right? You know? Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. And, that, and he was not raising his hand saying it was his at the time. Of course not. When Adam calls Jonah to tell him like, hey, your girlfriend's dead. He says that she, right away, he says that she killed herself and he's like, what, why? And he's like, Asian honor. Yeah. And like the Shack guys have always stuck to this. Like they've always said like, this must be Asian honor. And even when Jonah tells Dina while they're at the hospital, what happened? She's like, she has the same reaction. Like, what are you talking about? And he does like a, emotion like he's stabbing himself in the stomach and he says like you know Asian honor wow (laughs) what a way to change the narrative I mean what and how yes how insulting but Rebecca's family is always sworn like for so many reasons she never would have committed suicide like they don't you know they don't subscribe to this Asian honor theory they also point out that she was raised Christian and it's you know very against Christian religion to, to kill yourself. Like that's, you know, that's huge. They want to do that. And even if you're going to really dig into this Asian honor theory, which I'm not, I'm just absolutely not. Um, but I did see a couple documentaries and in, in a, a book where they talk to a specialist who knows about this kind of stuff. They point out immediately, like anybody who's dedicated enough to be doing like Asian honor is not going to kill themselves naked because that's, very dishonorable to the family. So like, the, like even all the experts are like, no, no way. So basically the only two people who keep, you know, blabbing on about Asian honor are these like rich white guys who have no clue what they're talking about. Of course. But what do rich guys do immediately when something like this happens? They <laughs> Lawyer up. Oh, you're so, you, <laughs> we're only nine episodes in and <laughs> you know it. Yeah. So he, He doesn't even just lawyer up. He gets like the best lawyer in the area, a former DA, and 
he has, the lawyer shows up to the crime scene, like same day. We're not even talking to, what I was going to say was even the Ramseys waited 24 hours. <laughs> like Jonah's like, I need you on site immediately. He's probably like, tell my dumb brother, Adam, to stop talking. Money talks, right? Money talks. Get on scene now. I want to know, you know, how I'm going to be represented. I want to make sure that you know everything about this crime scene, period. Yeah, exactly. So that I can get off. Yes, exactly. Come on. So at this point, the stock of his pharmaceutical company is tanking. Like right away, it starts taking a hit. So he hires his PR firm and eventually he's even going to ask the cops to put out a statement to say he's not involved in this death or anything. You know, you please go to the public and tell them that I had nothing to do with this because it's affecting my stock so badly. And obviously the police are like, uh, no, sorry, we're still investigating. We can't do that. And what a bold thing to ask anyways, like, uh, your girlfriend just was found dead. And, you know, that's, that's a bold thing to ask. It's yeah. It's so bold. It's, it's ridiculous, but, but he's a rich guy. Come on. He thinks he can ask anything. He thinks they should do anything that he asks. Unfortunately, three days later on the 16th max condition worsens and he passes away in the hospital. Oh my gosh. That is devastating. Devastating. Yeah. And that, in the beginning, the doctors were really hopeful. And then, you know, they just determined that he, he had too much brain damage. There was no way he was going to come out of this. And Dina, obviously, she wants the cops to investigate this death. She's, you know, she says that, she, you know, she knows it's tragic, but she doesn't think it's an accident. And the cops, you know, they say they're looking into it. But we'll get into that. I mean, basically, I gave you a lot of the information that they already found. They they really I, they didn't find much, and and I don't I don't know how much they really looked into it. They start they start going. You know, they're also invested. Obviously, they're looking at both deaths now. They're investigating Rebecca's, and they're going through her phone, and they find that she really wasn't that happy. You know, she's been taking notes for a while that she feels really empty and that she feels like when she's not worrying, she's crying. And it's not just from the accident. She, she really was worried before she's living with Jonah. I had said it earlier. She's in her head. She's like, we're not even married. And she feels like he maybe just brought her here to be the nanny. She flat out says no amount of money is worth the anguish that she's going through. It sounds like you know, she kind of like maybe lost her identity or something, or was just feeling like she was giving up her own goals and aspirations and life and future and plans to kind of just join Jonah and maybe be his trophy wife or younger wife, but also to help him with stuff he really didn't want to maybe be responsible for. So that's sad. Yeah. I, and I, I think you're right. I think she maybe thought like, I'm going to go there and we're all going to be so happy. It's going to be this happy little family and he's going to propose and we're going to get married and everything's going to be great. And then I think when she got there, that's not really, she wasn't living her picture perfect life. More money, more problems. Yeah. <laughs> money is not uh, the, the driving force to happiness. I've never felt that way. I mean, it could help, but I mean, <laughs> hell, it sounds like Jonah wasn't necessarily the happiest if he wanted her to join him. Like, you know, you have all this money, you can do whatever you want to do, but you want me to like uproot and leave my life in Arizona and come join you in San Diego. So sad. Yeah. They also find out. So Jonah had always stated that he called her that night and that she didn't answer, but that he had left a voicemail. And they find that the last call on her phone was her checking her voicemail or it was somebody checking their voicemail. So in their head, they think that she's checking her voicemail and then she gets this really bad news from Jonah and that this is kind of what sets her, sets her off. Cause Jonah says, I called her and I let her know that Max isn't doing any better. And they think that he's got more brain damage than they thought and that he's not going to make it. 
they later proved that this, this wasn't the conversation going on at the hospital at this point. They hadn't done the test to determine that. The doctors were still being optimistic. I mean, he's only six. They think, you know, he can possibly pull, you know, pull out of this. So, but none of those tests to determine this had ever, they hadn't occurred yet. And he even walks it back. He says, well, that's not actually what I said. What I said was that they don't think he's ever gonna speak or walk again. But then they determined that the test for that, they actually got the results back, you know, midday on the day they'd already discovered Rebecca's body. So none of it makes sense. And nobody's ever heard that voicemail. We're only going off what Jonah said. So if, if he really did leave her horrible news on that voicemail, we don't, we don't know what it was, but it wasn't the information he's saying he gave her. So after going through all of this, seven weeks later, the San Diego police decide to have a press conference. They admit this is strange. They've never seen anything like this. But overall, both of these are just tragic accidents. I don't understand why these investigators or, you know, officers that are on scene, it sounds like they're not investigating anything. It's like, oh, this is clear as day of suicide. But I, I want to bring up a movie that I watched. It's called The Life of David Gale. And in that movie, they're talking about the death penalty. And um, the main characters are like anti-death penalty. And so what I, I don't want to spoil the movie because I think it's a good movie, even though Kevin Spacey's in it. <laughs> but I think you should watch it um, because what they basically, I guess, reenact or prove that you can kind of stage your own death to make it look like a homicide. And then now, you know, if investigation isn't done or, you know, deep investigation isn't done, someone could be wrongly convicted of that crime just because everything else makes sense or it fits, or we just know this is the guy that did it. And that's a prime example of sounds like the same thing that happened here. They just didn't dig any deeper into, I mean, who, how would she have known how to tie the knot? How did she, how did she bind her own legs and her hands and hang herself in that fashion? Whose book was this? Like, I just feel like the, the painting on the door more should have been investigated. They do go into some of this. I don't want to say like the cops did nothing. Even at the press release, or I'm sorry, at the press conference, they show a video that they made. They found someone who worked for the San Diego police. She was very similar size, stature, around 100 pounds. She's 5'2". And they have her do the same stuff. They have her tie up her feet, then tie up her arms behind her back to see if she can do it. And they have her hobble over to the ledge to see if she'd be able to, you know, jump over the ledge. And she was able to do it. I will say the knots aren't exactly the same, but I think that they were just convinced that, you know, she lives on the ocean, they have a boat, she must know how to tie these knots. And if this lady can do it, she can do it. And they closed the case. Do you think more investigation should have been done? Do you think that they should have looked deeper into Adam um, or, or are you satisfied with them just saying, you know, these were just tragic accidents and suicide? It doesn't matter what I think because both of the families were not satisfied with the, these answers. And, you know, this is a good part about having money is that you can start, you know, going back after people, you know, you can kind of run your own investigations. So that does start with Dina Shackney. Right away, she's like, if, if you're not going to investigate my son's murder, and she's at that point is calling it a murder, then I'm going to hire my own forensic medical team, and they're going to take a look at it. So that's what she does. And right away, when the medical examiner is looking at this, she's finding a lot of inconsistencies. The very first thing she noticed that I already mentioned was the carpet in the hallway. So if the, the whole idea that the cops are coming up with is that, that Max is, you know, speeding away on his scooter and then somehow maybe 
maybe ocean runs in front of him or something and he ends up hitting the railing and flies over it and she's pointing out like there's really thick carpet here there's no way you could ever get that kind of speed up to for an accident like that to happen she also finds that max is too short like his center of gravity is too low there's no possible way that he somehow accidentally just fell over this railing there's also a lot of injuries on his body that don't correspond with the event that the cops are claiming happened so what the investigators say happened like she's able to prove like this their reenactment is not how you would have gotten these additional injuries there was also one specialist who claims they thought that Max had already been strangled before the incident even occurred. I can only find one instance of that. This medical examiner never specifically said that, but she does think that there's no possible way that he was conscious enough to say ocean when he landed on the ground. Like he, she doesn't buy Rebecca's story that he said that. She does agree that the cause of death is brain damage, but she's, she just thinks like there should have been an investigation. There's a lot of open, she had a lot of questions that couldn't be answered by the investigation. That's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. And the cops, yeah, they didn't do anything. They wouldn't look into it. They just, again, it's a tragic accident. So there's the Howe family decides, you know, we got to do the same thing. We got to contact an attorney. We got to, you know, find out what we can do they botched this case. We need justice for our, for our sister. Her sister was the one really fighting for this. And they decide, so what, what that team decides is the best approach is going to be to get her another autopsy. So they exhume the body and they do another investigation. So they find that there's all these head wounds that don't really align with, with anything that would have occurred from her, like jumping over the side and hanging herself. So they're really thinking there's intentional forceful wounds. They also find that there's injuries to the hyoid bone. So typically the hyoid bone is actually damaged when somebody strangles you. Like if you're getting strangled, it's your hyoid bone bone that's getting damaged. But if you're, when somebody hangs themselves, it's too high up. They don't actually damage the hyoid bone. So right away, that medical examiner had a lot of questions about that. They also look at lividity. And um, so this is when, so this is when there's a pool of blood that goes with the position of the deceased. So you would expect, I mean, she's hanging there. You'd expect to see all the blood pooling to her feet, but that's not where they find it. They find that it's on her back. Which means that she would have been hung after she was already deceased. Well, like she was laying down flat. Well, let's like get into that. Like if she was actually hung, I mean, the only person that has ever, you know, who saw her hanging was Adam Shackney. He's the one who allegedly cut her down. I just don't understand why your first instinct, especially if like I, I could see if Adam knew Rebecca, but it sounds like, you know, he really wasn't close with her, you know, he didn't really know who she was, like, aside from her but being wait, his, right? I wouldn't say that. So I don't know how close they were. But he didn't call Jonah and say, should I come out there when the incident happened? When he found out about Max, he called Rebecca and said, hey, what's the real situation? Do you think I should fly out there or not? Then, of course, because it's Adam, he needed to, like, follow that up with that. You know, he was actually really tired. He works a lot. And he would have been fine just staying at home. But I guess Rebecca was like, you need to just follow your heart and like do do what you think's right by you. And he said he kind of took that as like, she probably thinks I should come out there. Hmm. Well, if Rebecca made that statement that he should come out there, then that makes me question even more of why she would want to kill herself. Like why have more guests in the house? You know what I'm saying? Had Adam not come, she would have been by herself and, you know, at home. Right. Yeah. I don't know, man. That's so strange. 
And I'm not saying that, you know, calling somebody means you're super close, but I mean, it means you had our phone number. And I, I just think there's a, a little more level than just saying like, well, that's my brother's girlfriend. You know, we've seen each other a couple of times. They also find that when they, they find that the cops had confiscated Adam's phone and the computer and someone that night was searching sexy Asian girls in bondage anime. Adam. He is a character, huh? Right. But the cops say that could have been anybody. They say, basically, they say, like, somebody could have hacked into the system. They're like, it could have even been Rebecca. And I'm like, that's pretty specific. And I'm not judging her if that's her thing. But I think you would have found a few more searches before that night. Like, you know, tonight's right. not the night she's going to decide to, like, find out how kinky she can get. Right. Right. So they, they find all this new evidence. The cops still refuse to reopen the investigation. So Rebecca's family moved forward with a civil lawsuit against Nina, Dina, and Adam. And for four years, they were going after all of them. And then eventually, they were able to get a hold of these videos and various things that prove the alibi of Nina and Dina. And one of the reasons they really thought Nina or Dina was involved, that Nina and Dina were involved, was because there was a witness who had seen, they said they saw Dina at the house that night. And the women have claimed always that actually Dina was never at the house, that Nina was at the house. And that was because when Nina left the hospital, she still had questions for Rebecca and she was calling Rebecca and Rebecca didn't answer. And so she waited there for about a half an hour and was like, are you still up? And she's messaging her and calling her and everything. And she eventually gives up, but the neighbor had seen her trying to, you know, get into the house. And they just assumed that they, because they're twins, that they assumed it was Dina when really it was Nina. I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about the possibility of Nina or Dina coming back to the house to do something to Rebecca because they're upset. And, oh, that twist things. I think, I don't think it would have been Dina. This is, this is just an opinion, so who cares? But <laughs> I just personally think, like, you're devastated. You're not going to want to leave your son's side. I don't even think you're at the point of grief where you're, like looking to retaliate, you know what I mean? I, if this had happened, you know, three days after Max had died, I would be like, yeah, yeah, probably. Like, I'm sure she went after her, but that's not the situation. So, I mean, I could see Nina being like, I'm, I got my sister's back. Like that's my nephew, like that sort of situation. I do think Nina was being very aggressive. She was like, ah, uh, just cause the cops are buying your answers. Doesn't mean I am. She wanted to hear that story again and again. So there, there could have been that, but just to be like 100% clear, they were not involved. They fully had alibis. Uh, you know, th they lost their son and nephew. And I really think like, obviously they were victims in that. And then they were victims for four years when they were like pretty publicly being accused of being a part of this when there was, you know, actual video alibi proving that you know, Dina had never left the hospital. They even show her like leaving the hospital to go outside and smoke several times throughout the night and then going back in. And um, Nina was picked up. She was actually staying at Dina's house with her son. She had also brought her son with her. So there was, you know, there was just no way they were a part of this. So thankfully the lawyers, the, the how lawyer actually made a public appearance with them there. He does a, a press conference, you know, saying we made a mistake. You know, he made a very public apology saying we're very sorry. Like they had nothing to do with it. Um, and I, I thought that was, it was just pretty big of them. I, I, they probably didn't have to do that, but really should have. And we should probably see more of those. So the, the Howe family, you know, right away, they're like, well, we can't let this slow us down. Like we still think Adam was involved and they, this kind of changes everything, you know? So they move forward with only looking at Adam for the civil wrongful death case. And the motive kind of changes. They don't think it's just revenge over Max at this point. Now they're going to bring in more of the evidence kind of suggesting that there was a sexual assault. So in civil trials, we're generally 
looking at, you know, monetary settlements. That's why you go after them. There's, you know, the family says, Hey, we're not really going after it for the money. We're just hoping that this is going to get the cops to reopen the case. It's also, I don't know. Do you know a lot about civil, civil trials at all? No, not so much. So the only other thing that I know is that it's a lot easier to prove something in a civil trial because it doesn't have to be um, beyond reasonable doubt. So basically you don't have to get everybody on the jury to agree to it. You just have to get over 50%. So majority rules there. And here's the picture that their attorney paints. He says, Rebecca's in the shower. Uh, At this point, she's turned it off. And they know this because they found some spots of blood in there. And they think that, so they think she had time to dry off and get out of the shower. And then as she's getting out, she's confronted by Adam. Then somehow they know she was on the other side of the house again, because they find more drops of blood. They also end up finding her towel and her phone. Then they believe Adam hits her in the head and sexually assaults her. Yeah, they believe that the knife had been inserted or rubbed against her vaginal area. So, I mean, they think this is proof she was assaulted. The police had tested the knife, but nobody ever really did anything with this piece of evidence. They also brought in a handwriting expert who testified that he compared several letters because they have that, you know, that painted message. And overall, they thought that they could kind of prove that it looked, that he, basically he would guess that Adam wrote it over Rebecca. They also found that when you look at the, the height of the writing that, you know, again, Rebecca's five two. So they said it was like a lot higher than she would have done it. Uh, and Adam is 5'11", so they thought it was kind of the perfect height for him to have actually written that. They also said a big factor for them was the letter M. They said the M's looked very similar to how Adam writes his M's. So in the end, after presenting all of this evidence, the jury determines that Adam was guilty and they award the family $5 million. So Adam's furious, he's really mad, And he goes in front of the media and he calls the family a bunch of posers. Posers? That's the word. Posers. Yeah. They're just posers. I have to look up this Adam guy after this because Adam sounds like a real character. Posers of all words. Yeah. I should have told you more about Adam. So also like just let's go on a fun side note about Adam because- He, uh, so he's been, he actually does the opposite of what Jonah does. And he has been dating this woman for like 17 years or she's, he's been dating this woman forever for like 20 years. And she's 17 years older than him. (laughs) They're still dating, but they don't live together. They're not married. It's like a really weird situation. And then at one point the cops asked him if he's single and he says, yes. And they're like, well, we thought you had this girlfriend that we found. And he was like, well, I thought you meant like our, your marital status. <laughs> like, oh, so they're, they're definitely polar opposites. That's pretty hilarious. He actually took, uh, I'm surprised the attorney let him. So I think the attorney must have been pretty confident that he didn't do it because he let him take a lie detector test. And the cops say that the, they came out and said that the findings were inconclusive, but all these documentaries and everybody have been looking back at these and they think that he definitely lied. And he specifically lied about the question, did you do something to harm Rebecca? Or do you know if somebody did something to harm Rebecca? And he like across the board, everybody says he failed those. I was just shocked at all that you had your family had an attorney on site like day of and somebody let you take a lie detector test. That seemed weird to me. So the, the family is awarded this 5 million. My, my question is when there's a case like this, does Adam now get like arrested? No, because this is no, this is the same thing. We should really cover OJ Simpson because this it's is the, the same, same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing that happened to him. So yeah, he, and they got awarded $5 million. And I, I believe, I'm sure Jonah is the one who paid that. And the San Diego Sheriff's Department, re, they did reopen the case in 2018. But 
again, they just found that it was a suicide and they reclosed it. I don't know what you think. I, chances are he probably got away with murder for $5 million. That he didn't even probably, like you said, have to pay. I definitely am going to, my opinion would be that Adam had something to do with it. Had something to do with the murder of Rebecca or whatever you want to call it. And I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about the Max but I, I, I still think freak accidents happen. And sure, Rebecca may have been feeling like some, it would happen on her watch, you know, like has, has something ever happened like traumatizing on your watch and you're, you're caring for someone else's child or someone else just in general. Um, but I don't think that she, she committed suicide. I think that Adam definitely had something to do with it. I think that he probably had something to do with it. I can't say 100% that I think he had something to do with it, but I, I don't think she killed herself. There's just two, I mean, it's it makes sense if like a couple of things don't add up, but it's like nothing adds up to a suicide. Uh, and I really, everything I saw, like this isn't just me speaking, like I've seen every 2020 special, like all of these medical examiners, everybody was saying like, we've never seen an incident where a woman would hang herself naked. It's, you know, it's just way too vulnerable. And um, yeah, I just, I feel so bad for the family to have to see that. You know, imagine seeing your daughter laying there. On the news at all, you know. Oof. Right, on the news. I also don't blame Dina. I would, I would want justice. And if it was just a freak accident, you're not getting justice. And the she had already been fighting with Jonah about him not, properly watching max and you know making accusations that you we, why do we even have 50 50 custody if you're always working and rebecca's just the one taking care of him so um i understand i understand why she's mad she's always very careful to never accuse rebecca of murdering max basically i mean i have a feeling that's what she wants to say but i i think she also knows what it's like to be accused and Rebecca can't defend herself. So she's always very careful to say, to not, you know, directly say, I think that Rebecca did something. Wow. Well, I think that that's a, a remarkable thing to, to be able to do. And you, you have to have some composure to not be able to say maybe what you really think, um, even if it isn't true. Um, so that's, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. So that's all I have. I mean, I think this was a crazy case. I'm so thankful for this recommendation because I probably, at least not any time in the near future, would I have covered this case. And uh, I think we both learned a lot. Yeah, I thought this was an awesome episode. I love that we got this as a, as a request from a listener. So I'd like to add, if there are any additional listeners that have a special request of a case that they would like for us to cover, please let us know by sending us an email to a thousand miles of true crime at gmail.com. Well, thank you guys so much. We look forward to your recommendations. Um, if not, we hope you enjoyed listening and uh, we'll keep sending you guys more episodes. So see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>